Hello and welcome. Well, as children grow and develop, the need for social interaction with their peers the same age is crucial for their social and emotional development. However, throughout this COVID era, there have been extended periods of time that this has been decreased as we've each had to make and they're continuing to make sacrifices in order to protect our children, ourselves, our loved ones and the communities that we live in. As COVID is going nowhere, it's nowhere close to going away. We need to understand what are the short and the long-term effects of isolation on children. And the more we know, the better we can ensure that children are not missing out on developing crucial life skills and we are supporting them the very best that we can. To help talk to us about this today and to pr like provide you with tips to coach you through this, we welcome our special guest, Brianna Jane Sada, a Listen psychologist. Now, Listen is a mental health telehealth startup offering online psychology uh, counseling for anyone needing mental health and well-being support in particular to help facilitate care for rural and regional patients now brianna has worked with adults children young people and families and she has a particular passion for reducing stigma around mental health issues and help seeking thank you for joining us today how are you i'm well thank you rachel thank you so much for having me um, i'm very excited to to have a chat today yeah, likewise. And we definitely have a lot to talk about on this topic. And before we dig deep into the conversation about the effects of isolation on children, I'd love to ask just a general, some general questions, um, yeah, sure. just about what, I guess, what you have been experiencing lately. And COVID seems to have hit high density metropolitan areas in major cities in particular, mm -hmm. Melbourne, of course, yeah. at the moment with our current lockdown. Um, I'd just love to know, have you seen a rise in support in metropolitan districts as much as rural er areas or not? Yeah, I think there's um, concern spread across the country. Um, metro areas in, I guess, you know, a couple of months ago were definitely the focus of most of the concern. And that's when we saw the government increase their kind of funding towards telehealth platforms because, you know, we had to turn our focus to um, providing mental health support online um, because, you know, there was lockdowns all over the place, I guess. But more recently, our, our rural areas have seen um, some concern. I know uh, just watching the news yesterday, um, our kind of border towns, are, are, uh, there's a lot of concern at the moment, uh, given the lockdown over, you know, between us, we can't get to each other. So you know, between <laughs> Sydney and Melbourne, I know our border, our regional border towns, are, there is some concern there as well. Um, but I think, you know, you know, when the metro cities go into lockdown and that kind of thing, it has a trickle effect onto our communities as well. The, uh, for example, like some of our rural communities, they had the bushfires and everything that brought um, the challenges that that brought. And then, you know, just a couple of months later, COVID and the lockdowns of that sort, they've, they've had a different um, kind of level of concern and, and, and understandably so it's been challenging for them in their own way as well. What a year we're having at the moment, hey? So it's what been, has been... It's been a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> so like what has been your experience um, just in the recent months supporting Australian families through COVID and what can you share with us? Yeah, I think um, for our young people, um, some of them are just very frustrated, um, you know, not understanding maybe some of the decisions that have been made on their behalf. Um, you know, some of our older uh, young people, you know, those, for example, studying uh, their HSE, for example, or their VCE in other states, they're um, losing that year 12 experience and, and all of those <coughs> things that happen and, and not being at school for that final year is a bit of a challenge. Um, and But then we've got, you know, um, families that you know parents that have their own anxieties about COVID and not projecting them onto their young people has been a really big challenge and how they themselves um, can regulate themselves and, and look after their own mental health while you know looking after their kids so much more than they normally would. Um, homeschooling has been a struggle even though we don't want to call it homeschooling. Um, you know the, the idea is that kids are remotely learning um, but yeah that's been a real challenge for working parents. Um, the you know they've kind of taken on different roles at home so it, it's you're right it's been a really difficult year. Yeah so what are the types of things that people I guess have been reaching, reaching out for support during the crisis I mean and how do you see that we can support family and friends during this time just generally? Yeah. Just generally I think being a listening ear I think is really 
important um, when people are reaching out for support. Um, you know, the worst thing you can do is, is, is talk about yourself. You need to give people some time and space to talk about themselves and their challenges. And then your time will come later where you can use them for supports as well. Um, I think, you know, uh, for, um, for adults in, in particular, we, you know, we worry about ourselves, we worry about our children, um, but trying to give them a normal kind of experience and, and regulate ourselves is, is so important um, because, you know, we know our young people are social learners um, and, you know, the way we react to the situation is going to have a huge impact on how they um, imp uh, how they respond. Um, so Absolutely. if we can keep calm, if we can keep regulated, if we can keep rational, that's going to be of great support to them as well. Um, so, you know, being a good role model, I guess, essentially for our young people in our lives is, is, is crucial. Great advice. Great advice. And as we said earlier, I've got lots to talk about. Um, to begin with, we've published your article titled The Effects of Isolation on Children. So for someone who hasn't yet read the article, could you please just yeah. give us an overview of what it's about and tell us what inspired you to write it? Yeah, I think, um, well, I guess, you know, I wrote that a couple of um, weeks ago now when, you know, the whole country was in the midst of lockdown and, you know, professionals and families alike were really asking the question, you know, how is this period of isolation going to impact my child? Um, and, you know, psychologists and um, other um, mental health professionals, um, we know when we hear words like isolation, um, we get concerned. We know isolation is a risk factor for mental health conditions, um, not just in young people, in, in older people as well. Um, but I guess my particular passion is helping um, young people and children. And if I can do that um, by supporting their parents during this time, then I feel like I've um, made a small contribution. So, you know, that article really, I, I tried to make it as practical as possible. So there's some tips in there about how you can support your young people and your children um, through periods of isolation. And I guess it's become even more relevant now um, given that we have seen areas of the country go down, go into lockdown um, just this week. So, um, yeah. yeah, I hope I hope it's a practical resource for the parents. I'm sure it will be. It, it, and it is. And we'll have the link through to that article, of course, in the show notes, um, which I've read the article multiple times, as, as you would know. <laughs> and um, <laughs> it is very, very helpful. Now, I'd like to know from your perspective, you know, what do we know? about so social isolation and how it can actually impact children and young people? Well, I guess there has been some research into isolation itself, not for COVID, um, but over the years, you know, we've there is a body of research around what isolation can do um, to young people and to adults, but I guess our focus today is on children and young people. Mm -hmm. And that research comes from various um, countries from around the world, but isolation can happen for, for different reasons. You know, if uh, there's... Uh, war in countries or if children are experiencing long-term illnesses like cancer and those kind of things they can um, spend large periods of time away from peers um, so there is a, a large body of research about isolation now at the moment we don't have a great depth of research about particularly how the COVID isolation period is going to impact young people and children. So I guess some of we're using some of those learnings from past research studies um, and applying them um, in our current practices. Um, and there are some great researchers um, at the moment that are doing some research into this. So it will be really interesting to see what comes out of their research and in mm. particular how the COVID isolation period um, might differ from other isolation periods. But we know that isolation um, for, for young people can be um, quite um, impactful, um, both on children's development, but then also on how um, our older young people might respond to, respond to stresses in their life. So I guess for our younger, um, our younger children, you know, we're looking really at that developmental stage and how important social interaction is to their development. So not just to things like talking and you know, abstract thought and play and all of those kind of things, but also for life skills. Um, so, for example, you know, uh, self-soothing, you know, that, that huge part of that comes from your interaction with peers. When you're away from your family, you have to learn how to self-soothe as, as a young child. Um, and that typically happens, for example, at school, where you start having to, um, you know, be uh, an independent little person. 
um, for example, sharing, all of those kind of social development kind of skills that happens when you're away from the home and you're at preschool or you're yep. at school and you're learning how to share. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, sh it's short term isolation periods. Um, we don't hold a lot of concern, for example, over these kind of things, but the more that these isolation periods happen and the longer they seem to be going, our concerns increase a little bit um, in regards to how the development of our young people is going to be impacted. And then in our older teens, I guess the question um, also becomes, you know, it's not just being isolated but what are you doing during that isolation period and what are you no longer able to do because of the isolation period and then how does this impact on them and in particularly their mental health so mental health as in mental illnesses but also just their feeling of belonging their feeling of um, you know uh, being valued and all of those things that we get from our peers as a teenager yeah. um, all of those things come to mind as well so yeah it's a question of what are they doing during isolation but also what are they not no longer able to do as well and yeah. you know much attention has been placed on the negative impacts of isolation but in your view um have you know children and some young people i guess um seen any positive or helpful impacts of isolation at all yeah that's a really that's a really interesting question so if you ask most parents they would say it's been great you know we've had more time together as a family we're able to build on connections slow down and, and yeah. exactly slow down there's not much of a rush we're not rushing off in the morning for school drop off or you know rushing around on weekends and, and those kind of things so in that you know regard at first look there has been some positive impacts however there's some things that I guess concern us because they appear to be positive but the long-term impacts of them um, we're, we're starting to see as you know in some states people have gone out of isolation periods that some of the initial what we thought were positive has has actually shown some challenges so you know for example um, some of our young people that might um, present with some anxieties whether that be social anxieties or separation anxieties well when you're at home with your family you don't have to face those stresses um, that give you those anxiety kind of yes. feelings and, and those bodily reactions so that those kids that you know typically do come across quite anxious might be a lot calmer while they're at home and isolated um, so that appears to be a positive reaction but what we do know is these isolation periods are going to end and those young people that do have those anxieties are going to have to face those things that cause them anxiety so the question becomes you know when they do have to go back to school or they do have to face their peers and they do have to go away from mum and dad how is that going to impact their re-entry into I guess what we're going to call the new normal um, and how is that going to come out so for example i've seen many of my clients they're developing like school refusal behaviors um because they were so comfortable at home and you know home uh, remote learning was um uh, suited them for some of them yeah Ex exactly it fitted them because you know maybe they didn't have to face those peers at school that had been causing them distress or they got to hang out with mum and dad and you know maybe there was a predisposition there to some separation anxiety so now that some of our kids have had to go back to school we are seeing an increase in those kind of behaviors in those kids that have show those vulnerabilities already so what initially might seem positive you know um it, it's great um however like i said we need to prepare those kids that those isolation periods are temporary um, and that they are going to have to kind of face those uh, face those worries in the future. So the, the positive impacts have been for the children that are more introverted and that suited their personality type um, and Absolutely. or the, the way that they, they learn uh, and develop as, as, as individuals um, it suited them. And that's been the positive aside from yeah. that, there hasn't necessarily been any other positives. Do you think? Um, like I said, I think it's a great opportunity for families to reconnect um, and spend Definitely. some time, to spend some time together away from you know um, making dinner and prepping dinner together and then cleaning up and doing chores on weekend. There's just been more quality, valuable time that I think that um, families have been able to spend together. Completely and that, agree. That it, that's a positive, I think, in the short term and in the long term. Um, like I said, it's but for those kids that are at home maybe um, that are a little bit more of a recluse they do enjoy maybe spending a lot of time on the screen or um, on social media and and those kind of things even though they might present okay at home we have to ask ourselves a question in the long term is that going to be the best thing for them well speaking about long term what can parents do to help prevent some of the negative impacts of long-term periods of isolation then 
Yeah, I think um, this is this is, I guess, and the main point of the article, I think, is to say that there are really practical things that parents can do to support their children and their young people during these isolation times, because yep. we know that even as they face these challenges during isolation, our children are so resilient. Um, they have such malleable brains that um, basically mean that they can uh they can be flexible and they can adapt to these environments. So uh, with parents' help, we're, we're confident that our, our children and young people are going to be okay. So, you know, for example, depending on where you live in Australia, um, you might be able to encourage safe face-to-face -face, um, interaction with same-age peers. So, you know, in some areas of Australia at the moment, that might be socially distant play dates. Um, and, you know, in areas like Melbourne, it might be face-to-face um, -face video calling and that kind yes. of thing. That would be safely monitored by parents and, and those kind of things. Um, but, you know, the more that we can encourage safe face-to-face -face communication, the better it is for our young people. And that even goes for, you know, um, uh, you know, infants, um, you know, the more that they can speak and interact with same age peers, the better it is for their long term social development. So I guess that's, that's one thing that would be really um, important. I guess I spoke before about the question, what are young people doing when they are at home? And I guess yes. parents are reporting that there's a lot more screen use. So, um, you know, they're playing, they're playing games online with their same age peers or they're, you know, um, on social media with same age peers. So not all online use is a bad thing. And I know it gets a bad rap sometimes. Um, Moderation. But, in moderation, it's good. So parents, we want to encourage them to really safely monitor their use. And that doesn't just mean, you know, reading messages that the young people are sending or that their children are sending. But I, I really also encourage parents to monitor a young person's mood um, before, during and after they've been using social media or talking to peers online. Because that Great will give advice. you an okay. Yeah, so that'll give them an indication about how, you know, that interaction is making that young person feel. So ideally, you know, loneliness occurs because you don't have that desired social interaction that you want. But if, you know, if they're going online and they're having negative interactions, that will impact their mood. So we want those online interactions to be safe and fruitful. So if you're noticing a negative impact on their mood, you might need to have conversations about making that a little bit more of a positive experience for them. That's really great advice. Yeah, thank you for sharing yeah. that. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> now, talking about social distancing, you know, what effects do you yeah. think um, social distancing may have on children and what do parents, I guess, need to do to overcome it? I think keep it... Um, uh, so I guess one of... And I guess this is, again, something that parents can do, but really being mindful here not to project our anxieties onto uh onto our children so yeah. um be be factual about why we want a social distance but we don't need to um create hysteria or create um any sort of we don't need to dramatize that idea about um, social distancing either. So we want to encourage hand washing, we want to encourage hand sanitizer use and safe distancing, but we don't want to appear oh, quickly, step away, you know, we don't want to, you know, it's going to cause anxiety create... in the children. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So being a little bit more factual around it. So, you know, there's some great activities, there's some great videos online. At, um, you know, even the Wiggles have a great song about why we need to social distance. So using those things that are factual, but aren't causing anxiety is going to be really important. Um, I think, you know, parents come with the best intention, um, you know, when they're asking, uh, you know, their child to, to step away from someone. But if you appear distressed, the young person is going to learn that they need to be distressed in the presence of other people. Yes. So we don't, we don't want to, um, we don't want that to be the message we're sending. We want to um, send the message that it's important to keep our hands clean and to cover our mouth when we cough and all of those kind of things. Um, but again, without the anxiety and without the drama that can sometimes come with that. And in replace of that, just providing the reasons why and... Exactly. You know, yeah. Age appropriately. Makes, age appropriately. Which totally makes sense. Yeah. Um, of course, um, as you've mentioned <laughs> here in Melbourne, um, I'm, I'm in Melbourne, but, um, you know, in the metropolitan areas we're experiencing, um, some may call this a second wave. Um, if you look at the numbers, I think you confidently could say it is a second wave. Um, mm. Anyway, that's up for interpretation. But I'd like yeah. to know from um, your perspective, what's your opinion on the impact that this will have um, on children here in Melbourne? With, with regards I, to the effects of isolation, of course. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, 
you know, uh, we worry about the long-term presence of anxiety. So if children are isolated and they're anxious, um, that means that there's going to be a long-term period of anxiety. And we know that long-term periods of anxiety aren't just bad for our mental health, they're bad for our physical health as well. Um, so, you know, we, the anxiety creates uh, hormones um, that, you know, initiate our fight, flight, freeze response. And mm -hmm. the long-term presence of those hormones can be impactful. So um, isolation, you know, we worry about, you know, some psychologists call it the third wave is going to be the mental health impacts that isolation can cause. I have we seen that be, online. Yeah. 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 So we're going to need to respond after isolation to the mental health implications that these um, that this, the COVID-19 kind of isolation periods are going to um, result in, I guess. So parents need to be really mindful um, about making that isolation period not an anxious time. I, you know, you had, um, uh, I guess, uh, Dr. Justin Coulson, I think a couple of weeks ago, and he was talking about the importance of play. So isolation doesn't have to be this scary time where we all sit and watch the news and worry about what COVID is going to do next. It can be a time of novelty and creativity, and it can be a time where maybe we relax a little bit on um you know the rules around the house so you know the bedroom doesn't have to be as tidy as it would normally be because we want to encourage creativity and novelty in the house so we can you know that'll increase the young people's mood um but also that period of isolation won't be a detrimental thing it won't be a negative yes thing. yeah um, so you know making that an exciting time if possible um and and not like i said not waiting and, and watching what's going to happen to COVID next yes. you know i've seen some some 10 and 11 year olds that can recite how many numbers of COVID um cases there are and how many deaths there have been and that really Goodness concerns me because mm. you know what conversations are happening at home where the young people are so um attuned to that that those kind of things concern me yes that that's quite alarming actually but in their own yeah. way they're probably just trying to understand what is happening in the world around them and depending on their personality type that's how they maybe as you said it's just attuned to it to, to the world around them but it is um absolutely a, a little bit concerning how that would affect them yeah. definitely yeah. um yeah. talking about younger children for the moment the formative years yeah. i guess of children's education um is about providing experiences to help develop like healthy social interaction and inclusion like learning to share and taking turns i many years ago thought that preschool education was about teaching abcs and one two threes but if anything it's yeah. completely well it's not necessarily on that it's about supporting the development of children's interpersonal and relationship building skills and supporting yeah. their social and emotional development um, and mm -hmm. many children um have missed out and are continuing to miss out um on um exposure and access to early education at present for um, a range of different reasons. So in your opinion, do you think this will um, impact them? And if so, what are the short and long-term long effects I think that, uh, I think you're right. I think, um, and some of the things you were just talking about, I, you know, uh, developing a child's EQ is just as important as developing their IQ. So EQ oh, being their emotional intelligence. And I think really, you know, we really see that in preschool and, and in those formative years where a child does learn how to share or does, you know, um, understand the concepts of empathy and, and all of those kind of things that their behaviors can impact other people. All of those kind of things are so important. So potentially we might see a delay in these skills um, developing. Um, however, these skills can be developed later on. Um, so, you know, if there are extended periods of time where a young person isn't learning these things from their same age peers, I think we, these will pick up later on. Um, you know, it might mean that they struggle a little bit more in um, those early school years because there has been a delay in some of the social skills that they need to develop. Um, or, like, for example, even their self-regulation. Um, again, something that definitely happens in those um, preschool kind of years where, you know, you are away from mum and dad, so they do have to rely on self-soothing and those kind of things. So we might see issues there. And even, for example, um, you know, pr uh, parental separation and those kind of things, that separation anxiety that, you know, typically kids can get over in those um, preschool years. By the time you get to kindergarten, hey, I've, I've done this before. I've been away from mum and dad before, so I'm going to be okay. We might see a delay in those kind of things as well. But um, again, because children are so resilient um, and they're so adaptive and so flexible, I think these skills might happen a little bit later, but it doesn't mean that they won't happen at all. Mm -hmm. So in the short term, what can parents do to help support and overcome this challenge, do you think? 
Um, th that's a that's a tough one again, especially depending on on where you're living. Um, you know, in of Melbourne, course. it is going to be yeah, it is going to be hard for you know um, parents to encourage uh, peer interaction for their children um, when you can't when you're in a uh, an area that's in lockdown. Um, so you know, when those restrictions are eased, doing that in a safe way um, would be really helpful. Um, you can. Uh, encourage sharing and, and teach turn taking and, and all of those kind of things even empathy um, you know there's some great children's books these days that um, that try and uh, convey that um, idea of empathy um, so that there is some great resources out there for parents but it's about being really mindful of these things and acknowledging that my child isn't getting this outside of the home so I need to bring this into the home and, and try and teach these skills here Mm -hmm. And um, we've just recently published an, an article um, on the importance of developing um, emotional intelligence in children. Um, oh, and we've got a, an upcoming podcast on that also. But um, oh, I, um, yeah, I think it is very, very important, um, even if parents themselves maybe for whatever reason um, have, have sort of learn, learned that they haven't actually maybe developed um, fully develop their emotional intelligence skills and, and, and empathy. I think it's something that no matter w wherever you are on that, 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 that spectrum, it's important to understand that children need that. Um, and yeah, and definitely. as you said, there are books and there are resources. Um, and as I said, like we've just published an article and we'll have a, a podcast coming up about that as well. So it is extremely important to be able to yeah, bring that's... that into the home, as you just said. Yeah, um, I think so. And, you know, because parents will be very mindful about making sure they are learning their ABCs and learning how to write their name. Um, but those social um, skills that they develop, you know, being a bit more mindful and, and a little bit more active in, in teaching those things and explicitly teaching those things as well. Yeah. So I guess, you know, long periods of isol um, social isolation can disturb that natural development of these important life skills. Um, yeah. So, you know, with preschoolers in, in particular, um, you know, how else do you think that they can maybe help them to better form relationships around the home? Um, is it, it would just be man, mainly be with family members, I guess, wouldn't it? Yeah, it will be. I mean, um, again, a young person would loves the idea of showing um, granny and grandpa around the house and, and, you know, um, you know, look what I drew and all of those kind of things, you know, you can facilitate, um, I guess, those video call kind of, um, uh, conversations at home um, if they've got younger cousins and, and that kind of thing that might be something you're a little bit more mindful of about how you can make sure they're interacting but also play play is a great opportunity um, to enact some of the social um, kind of uh, scenarios that they might be missing out on at preschool or you know um, in kindergarten um, so really encouraging that idea of play and you know uh, you know creating scenarios where they do have to express empathy or they do have to share. Um, and, you know, th those, they're great opportunities for, for young people. But, you know, parents are, you know, living their life, they're working from home, they're doing all of those really important things. Um, so, you know, being mindful, just to be sitting there present with the child, putting your phone down, face-to-face -face communication, you're the person they're getting their social cues from right now. Um, so it's so important that you're active and you're present with them um, so that they are picking up and they are learning those things from you. Yes, absolutely. And what about primary school age children, starting with um, early um, age children in the five to seven year, year age group? Um, some of these um, are a little too young to use, I guess, some um, online forums to stay connected with their friends each day. Do you see any short or long-term effects? And if so, what are they and how can parents help their children to overcome them? Yeah, first, the first thing I will say, Rachel, is that I, I thought too, five to seven was too young to be engaged online. But there are platforms and um, the, a new platform called Roblox comes to mind. Um, yes, all about where that. Yeah. Young, yeah, where young people are, you know, there are seven, six-year-olds that are wanting to engage online with their peers. So being, you know, parents being really attuned to that and being really kind of monitoring that use is going to be really important. Um, but again, you know, those interactions can come from family members. So if parents are, um, you know, encouraging of that, that is going to be really important. Like I said, they themselves, um, you know, facilitating relationships between their siblings even um board games family nights board games all of those kind of things um it 
can be so um, instrumental in young people developing those skills that we want them to see. Um, and then, you know, like I said, they will have memories of that time being a positive experience for them. Um, it's going to be quite, um, you know, uh, we want kids to experience novelty and fun because they're the things that they would have been experiencing with their, with their peers. So however we can do that in the home is really important. So that means sometimes a parent might have to interact with the child a little bit differently than they normally would um, to try and facilitate some of that growth. Can I ask you about conversational skills? Um, understanding that um, some of these interactions, let's talk about this five to seven year age group at the moment. So if sure. they become accustomed to communicating with their friends through Roblox or um, there's, yeah. there's a new kids messenger um, that's just been launched and what, whatever the, 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 the platform is, what is your opinion on children I don't want to say losing the the ability to be able to be conversational because that, that's that's not the, what I'm trying to say, but ensuring that they are fully developing their their conversational skills. And this does sort of, I think, sort of tied back to partly, I think, sort of some emotional mm -hmm. intelligence. Or you tell me if I'm wrong, I definitely want to know. if that. It's just that I'm finding that a lot of children um, are becoming disengaged face-to-face -face, um, because they're finding it is that that's their, their way of communicating is, is through an online platform, um, short, sharp, sweet, sort of, you know, um, sentences and or what, whatever their, their their level of communication is but getting into a big deep and meaningful conversation that has meaning and substance and all of those mm. those big questions and, and that really do sort of prompt the ability to think laterally and think bigger and all of these big important things are we losing that and is, is that going to be um potentially something that parents need to be aware of during these these periods of um social isolation to be able to prompt a child to sit down and have that conversation over the dinner table as opposed to just having a one word answer i don't know what are your thoughts i think what you're saying is is really true rachel i guess um in education, we're definitely seeing um, those kind of text-based conversations come out in some of young people's writing. And that can be, you know, through incorrect spelling of things because they're so used to um, typing things a certain way <laughs> on their phone and or, you know, on their gaming console. Um, that we do see those kind of things transfer into other areas of their life. So it's definitely having an impact. Um, I think we don't want to, you know, if, if young people um, and children of that age group, if they are, if we limit their, their usage to a safe amount and we make sure that when they aren't online and they aren't using that kind of text-based communication, that they are, you know, engaging in proper conversations with eye contact and, and all of those kind of things, whether that be with siblings or whether that be with their parents, um, that hopefully, hopefully that will counterbalance some of those things. Um, because like I said, you know, a safe amount might be half an hour to an hour a day for, for those, um, for that age group. And, you know, then they've got all the other hours of the day to interact appropriately um, through their words and through their conversation with, with siblings or, or their parents. Um, like I said, we do see some of that trickle into schoolwork and, and all of those kind of things. So it's definitely something to be mindful of. Um, I, and, you know, again, you know, uh, with, as, the, as they get a little bit older, they're spending more time online. Um, hopefully some of these skills have already developed by then that the time that they're spending online um, won't take away from the skills that have already been learnt. Um, so those formalities are really important. Um, you know, like I said, a safe amount. It, it's, it's so hard because, you know, when uh, parents are at home working now and the kids are saying, I'm bored, I'm bored, it is really, it's, it's a lot easier to hand them the iPad or to hand them the phone um, and to keep them occupied that way. Um, so, you know, finding opportunities to stimulate them um, for novelty, for expression and all of those kind of things that doesn't necessarily involve a, a an iPad or, a, or an iPhone it can be really challenging. But like you said, if those um, skills are important to the parents, then they will prior prioritise, I guess, those activities. Yes. And how about um, the 8 to 11, say, 12-year-old group um, who are old enough to use social connection through whatever platform that they're, they're allowed to have yeah. exposure and, and yeah. to be able to use? How do you see this age group affected? That's a tough one because by that age, um, you know, no longer 
is social interaction just taking place at school? If you're not on the social media platforms that they're using or the gaming platforms that they're yep. using, there is that sense of missing out. Yep. Um, you know, they, they, the conversation that takes place at school or on the video chat the next day, or well, they've missed out on something that happened the night before. So, um, you know, as, as adults, we used to think about this as um, a virtual reality space, but for young people now, it very much is their reality. This is where their social connections take place. I guess we need to teach young people, I guess, what safe use looks like of these. So if yes. people are being unkind and if people are excluding other people, um, making them aware of that um, and making sure that they have connection outside of that space as well. Mm. Um, so, you know, so important, um, like like depending, like we were saying, depending on where you're living, um, if you can facilitate proper face-to-face and one-on-one as well, communication I think is really important because sometimes in these group chats you've got five or six young people um, and there isn't that quality of connection there, um, but they do have this fear that if they're not going to be on there that they are going to be missing out. Um, just like, you know, when I was a young person, if I you know didn't get to go to that party on the weekend, I felt like I was missing out. Well, now those events are happening every day online. Yes. So, we, you know, as parents and, and adults, we have to be really mindful that um, this is their reality and we have to help them navigate it safely. Well, I was going to ask you, what are your thoughts on in the social media and the effects of the excessive use of it too? You know, it is a challenging time as largely this is how children are staying connected with their friends these days. So what are your thoughts on that <laughs> yeah i guess there's some really clear research there's some really clear research especially um as they hit their teenage years that um, an increase in social media use does have a negative impact on young people's mental health so we see increase um, increases in symptoms of depression and anxiety and all of those kind of things and that happens for a multitude of reasons but really when the young person is online it's the same as what they're searching for in person young people are looking for connection they're looking for belonging absolutely um, they're comparing themselves to other people just like they do on the playground. You know, that comparison happens online as well. So, um, you know, whether they're measuring their self-worth through likes or comments or they're comparing their life to the life that, you know, is being portrayed by um, their peers online, um, you know, it does have an impact on their mental health um, in the long term as well. So we know that, that the evidence is quite clear there. That So, again, it's about teaching those lessons. I think, you know, this is happening um, at school now. There's development classes around this idea of online um, use we we have body esteem um, kind of classes and all Fantastic. those kind of things that does that do, that do really address those issues of um, that idea of comparing ourselves to people online. So we want to be really mindful that um, w- what is presented online isn't always real um, and it isn't always honest, and that we want to facilitate them finding their self worth and finding their belonging and finding that that connection with people away from the online space as well but there's some great things that do happen online so it's just about monitoring them safely there's absolutely some great support groups that you know you can connect in you know with peers that have the same interests as you some great things happen online but it's just about making sure they're doing that safely and like i said before really monitoring your young person's mood so monitoring their social media use or their, their internet use or their gaming use shouldn't just be about checking to make sure there's no swearing or anything like that in their text messages but it should also be about monitoring their mood how do they appear and how do they present after they're they're using 100 um, percent platform yeah. a- um, and then addressing that yep yeah. great point that you made earlier too yes monitor what was there, um, yeah, how, how were they before and how are they after the interaction exactly. online. Now, I wanted exactly. to speak to you about loneliness. You know, what, what do you think the effects of lo- loneliness are on children? Yeah, again, really, really clear. Um, loneliness increases the risk of mental health issues. Um, we loneliness it's a funny thing because you know when I talk to parents about this they'll say but you know we're always with our young people and they've got siblings and they've got us and we're there so it's not about physically being by yourself Mm. Um, loneliness loneliness is about connection or that discrepancy between the the social connection you want and the social connection you have so um, they might want to be you know want to engage with their peers and if only family are around them they can experience loneliness because the social connection they want is different to what it's they different, have. Of course. Exactly. Um, so yeah, it's about finding connection. Um, it doesn't have to be quality, uh, sorry, quantity. It's not about having many, many, many connections. Um, you can, um, 
and negate the impacts of loneliness just by having one quality relationship with someone. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be about you know, hours and hours and hours of um, communication with different friends. It can just be that one solid relationship that provides that quality connection that that young person needs. But it, it's quite clear um, loneliness is a huge risk, risk factor um, for, for mental health issues. And I guess, so what social isolation does, it increases that risk factor. Our young people might be feeling lonely, our children might be feeling lonely, but also it takes away some of the protective factors as well. So we know that social support, for example, is so important for our young people to mitigate some of the risk factors in their life. But mm -hmm. because we're socially isolated, it takes away some of those opportunities for social connection. So yes. while our risk factors are increasing, we're also reducing protective factors. So we need to mitigate our risk factors by building more protective factors. Yes. And talking about mental health challenges, I mean, what sort of mental health challenges should parents be looking out for um, with their children and, you know, what can parents do to overcome them? Yeah, so especially for our younger younger children, um, sometimes um, mental health challenges might not come across as clearly as, for example, a teenager's or an adult's. Um, you know, depression symptoms or anxiety symptoms might actually come across as anger or agitation um, be, because a young person doesn't know how to necessarily express verbally um, how they're feeling. So you might just see defiance or you might just see, um, you know, a short fuse, for example, on a, on a little one. Um, so it's, it's just about that change in change in personality, that change in behaviour, anything that you might be a little bit concerned about. Um, is, this, you know, is, this, is that long term? Sorry to interrupt. Sorry. But yeah, uh, sure. over what period of time would you need to be able to monitor that to be able to, to understand that, this, that, that there is a, a change as opposed to it just being a one-off? Yeah, so it, a longer period of time. For example, if they're having a bad day, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're, uh, they've got a mental health issue. But we are looking for longer longer term changes okay. um, so for, for anxiety you'd be looking for a pattern of behavior as well so are there certain instances where these behaviors are presenting themselves um you know for example every time you know someone comes over or that you know you'd start talking about school do they start you know getting a little bit defiant or a little bit agitated that might be an indication that okay well, something about going back to school is is getting them upset um you know for mood changes um, like depressive symptoms, it might only be a couple of weeks um, that you might be concerned. You might want to start talking to a mental health professional um, about some of those things. Um, and, you know, sometimes I guess uh, the best thing that a parent can do as well is be really mindful of their own, um, their own reactions and is that impacting the, the young persons. And it might be about the parent getting their own mental health support and making sure that they are regulating themselves properly um, because again, because children are uh, social learners, the modelling that we uh, show them is going to be so important and we can actually um, inexplicitly and, and un without even realising it, um, be teaching those behaviours. So it's a very fine line, isn't it, really, where parents are at the moment with being able to negate, you know, ensuring the children aren't experiencing mental health issues, that they that, that, mm. that, 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 that they don't have the feelings of loneliness, yet they do have the ability to, to connect with their peers at the same age as well. Um, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's I, I don't know, like, look, what are your thoughts um, in, in, in how parents can sort of navigate this, this new world that we're, that we're living in at the moment? I think, you know, keep in mind that, you know, 95% of the kids are going to be okay and they might show some short-term struggle. But as, as, as I was saying, our young people and our children are so resilient um, that, you know, professionals are quite confident that most of our young people are going to be okay. If parents are coming to these conversations with their young people and, you know, with love and concern and support, um, that's a huge protective factor for them. So that's going to be really crucial when we're talking about long-term impacts. If they've got the love and support of their parents, that's, that's what we look for really about when we're looking at long-term prognosis for our young people. If parents are coming to those um, interactions, um, you know, with the best of intentions, then I'm confident our young people are going to be okay. For those that do have predispositions or vulnerabilities um, already, this period might be a little bit more challenging for them. So for parents, it's, it's going to be about really that foresight and um, the being prepared as well. So 
having these conversations regularly, checking in with their children and their young people about how they're feeling. Like I said, provide opportunities for fun and excitement and novelty um, at home if they if they can't get those things at school or you know um, on the weekend with their peers, um, and try to make it a positive um, a positive space. Um, isolation and you know doesn't necessarily have to come with so much negativity and, and anxiety attached to it um so you know if we're if we're being really mindful and, and we're being prepared that you know this is challenging for us as adults but it's also challenging for our young people mm. i think that um i think that we can be we can handle this well yes this we've covered a lot today i guess if we you have. were to <laughs> summarize your key messages to any parent uh, or carer watching and or listening what will your key messages be um i think like i said i think most of our kids are going to be okay but i guess we need to um be mindful of how they're feeling um not going to school, going to school, not seeing our friends, all of those kind of things are big deal for our young people. So even though we feel like this is more challenging for us, you know, a child not getting to um, go on that excursion that we're really looking forward to or missing out on their birthday party, um, those kind of things, they're big life events for those little people. So we need to be really mindful of um, how that might impact them. So having age appropriate conversations with them, reminding them that this is temporary is really important. We don't have an end date yet, so not making false promises, but, um, you know, reminding them that this is temporary is, is going to be really important as well. Um, and, and like I said, parents monitoring themselves and, and getting the support that they need too, so um, that they can be the are the best version of themselves for their young people and their children during this difficult time, I think is going to be really important as well. Fantastic advice. Now, if parents have got any other questions for you and or want to reach out, whereabouts can they find you guys? Yeah, so um, I run my private work through Listen Health. So you can jump on um, the website and you can pick from a whole bunch of um, Australian psychologists on there and, and uh, use our telehealth platform, which is fantastic. Um, and I've also got my website. So I'm at briannajane.com and you can find me on Instagram as well. Wonderful. We'll have all of those links in the show notes. Thank you so much, Brianna, for your time. I've loved this conversation and really Thank hope you. for the opportunity for another one again in the future. Take care and stay safe. Bye-bye. You too. See you later. See you, Rachel. Thanks so much. Okay, bye. Bye.